So one of the biggest worries about using the logit model is that it can give these substitution patterns that are somewhat unrealistic. We saw the first sign of this on the last slide of the last video, where we saw that elasticities, cross elasticities, only depend on the, uh, uh, the other alternative, but not the alternative we're thinking about. Uh, go back and take a look at that uh, to refresh yourself if, you, if you're not watching these right in sequence. This is uh, a result or an example of this property of logit models, which we call the independence of irrelevant alternatives. And we can see this if we think about the, uh, let, let's take the, the ratio of, the, of two choice probabilities, two logit choice probabilities, the choice probability for alternative I and alternative K. Well, remember, they're both gonna have the same denominator. So those cancel out. So when we take this ratio, it's just gonna be the exponential of I's representative utility divided by the exponential of K's representative utility. So this ratio, the probability of choosing I over K, it only depends on attributes of alternative I and K. Nothing else, you know, nothing about the rest of the choice set. So we say that this relative probability is independent of irrelevant alternatives. When we're thinking about this comparison between I and K, the only thing that enters the ratio is I and K. There are no other alternatives here. They're irrelevant. So this ratio, this, this, this comparison is independent of irrelevant alternatives. This property actually has some, some nice uh, implications and some not so nice implications. Let's start with the good news and talk about the nice implications. Um, one thing that IIA means is that if you have a choice set that's too large to be computationally feasible, there's some examples of papers out there where it's, uh, you know, a classic example is one where uh, uh, it's, Dan McFadden, Ken Train, and, and, and Moshe Ben-Akiva are looking at, I think those are the authors, are looking at how people choose uh, telephone plans and then how they choose when they make calls. If you think about the dimensionality of thinking about when and how often people make telephone calls, like every hour or every minute of the day, and the, the dimensionality of the problem just gets huge. So there's like, you know, thousands, if not millions of different choice sets there. Do you, do you make a call at seven o'clock? Do you make a call at 701? Do you make a call at 702 in the, in the evening, for example? So just a huge choice set. Well, one nice thing about IIA is that if your choice set is that large and it's computationally infeasible, then you can actually get consistent parameter estimates using only a subset of the alternatives. So you don't have to think about all the alternatives out there you can just randomly select a few and you're still gonna get consistent parameter estimates. So that's nice. I mean, we're in a world now where computational feasibility is, is, becoming, is becoming much much broader. So, so that might not even be such a concern anymore, but definitely uh, you know, back in the 80s it was, and that was one nice aspect of assuming IIA. The other nice aspect is that, suppose you only care about a subset of the choices. So, so maybe we observe commute choices again, but we only care about how people choose public transit. We care about how people substitute between driving and public transit. There are all these other options, Uber, walking, biking, but that's just like, that, that's outside the scope of our research question. We can just ignore those. We can set those aside because the choice between driving and taking public transit, that comparison is independent of any other alternative, any irrelevant alternative. If we're only thinking about those two, we can think about everything else as being irrelevant and just ignore them. So that's good, but there is a downside. And the downside is best exemplified by this classic example called the red bus, blue bus problem. I know we're really heavy on commute examples, but I think it's something, it's what discrete choice was basically 
built on was thinking about commuting examples. And uh, I think it's something everyone is really familiar with, making the choice of how do I, how do I get somewhere? Uh, and so I think it's, it's something that we can, we can all easily relate to. So we're gonna stick with it. And in this classic example, we're thinking about having two travel modes to commute to work, a car and a blue bus. Blue bus, I just mean literally a bus that is the color blue. For simplicity, let's start by assuming those choice probabilities are equal. Everyone is just 50-50 on whether to take the car or the blue bus. So the ratio of car to blue bus equals one. Okay, now let's suppose that a red bus is introduced, identical in every way to the blue bus, except the color is red instead of blue. And let's assume that a commuter does not care about the color of the bus. That seems reasonable. Uh, you're not gonna pass up the blue bus just so you can take the red bus when they're otherwise completely identical. So if the red bus and the blue bus are identical, then they should have the same choice probability. So the choice probability or the ratio of red bus and blue bus, that should be one. Okay, but from the independence of irrelevant alternatives, adding the red bus shouldn't change anything about the comparison between the car and the blue bus. When we're just thinking about car versus blue bus, the red bus is, is irrelevant. We, we, can, we can ignore it, which means that ratio, the ratio of the choice probability of car to the choice probability of the blue bus hasn't changed. Nothing about the car or the blue bus has changed, so that ratio is still one. So it must be the case now that the ratio between the choice probability of car and blue bus equals one, and the ratio of red bus to blue bus equals one. But what are we saying here? What we're saying is that the choice probability of driving, of taking the blue bus, and of taking the red bus are all equal. They all have to be equal. So they're all a third. Okay, let's summarize real quick. We started off car and blue bus, each with a choice probability of 50%. We added a red bus. Now the choice probability of driving is only a third. The choice probability of taking the blue bus is only a third. And the choice probability of taking the red bus is a third. Why has added, why, why has, has adding a red bus that is otherwise identical to the blue bus, why has that changed people's choices about driving? It shouldn't have, right? There, there should be no reason that that changed whether you want to drive or not, just because now half the buses are red instead of blue or something like that. That shouldn't change your, your choice to drive at all. But the logit model says that it will. And that is why we sometimes say that the substitution pattern in the logit model is overly restrictive. And we can see this by once again, just looking at that cross elasticity that we, that, we, uh, that, we, that we had in the previous video. Once again, the elasticity of I, elasticity of alternative I with respect to some attribute of alternative J only depends on J. It doesn't depend on I at all. And what that means is that the cross elasticity is going to be the same for every alternative other than J. We change something about J. We have all of our other alternatives out there. All of their elasticities with respect to J are exactly the same. It doesn't matter what alternative it is. It doesn't matter how similar that alternative is to J or not. If we change J, everything else changes by the same elasticity, which means that any substitution into or away from those other alternatives is just gonna be proportional to whatever their original choice probabilities were, which we might think is, is, is unrealistic in really many settings. But let's look at one example here that I think really makes this concrete. Let's say there are only three cars on the market. Or maybe we only care about these three cars, because remember with IIA, we can just think about only, only the example, only the alternatives we care about. So let's think about just these three. We've got a Hummer H2, a Cadillac Escalade, 
and a smart car EV. Okay, you might notice two of these cars are very similar to each other and the third is very different. But suppose that Hummer lowers the price of the H2. They put the H2 on sale. In Intuitively, what do we think? Will that attract more, a greater proportion of Escalade drivers or of smart car drivers? Is that gonna attract any smart car drivers? Is there anyone out there who's driving a smart car and they thought, if only the Hummer was a little cheaper, I would have chosen that instead? Probably not. So we might think that lowering the price of the Hummer will have no effect on smart car purchases, but it could have a huge effect on Escalade purchases because probably those cars are, are in a really similar segment of the market. But the Logit model says that substitution to the H2 is gonna be proportionally equal for both the Escalade and the smart car. And that just seems unrealistic. There are gonna be some settings where maybe it's fine to make this assumption, but certainly in this example right here, that seems way overly restrictive if we, if we actually care about interpreting those substitution patterns. So that's the big downside of the logit model. Uh, in the next video, we'll keep talking about more properties and in particular talk about some of the properties of, of the parameters that we're, that we're estimating in these models.